post was Commissioner for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion uh, between 2010 and 2014. Prior to that, uh, Laszlo, from the years uh, 2005 to 2010, was a member of the Board of Directors at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, representing Hungary, the Czech Republic, the Slovak Republic and Croatia. You have been a professor also, an associate professor at the Department of Economic Policy in the Kavinos University in Budapest since 2000. You are very welcome indeed, and I give you the floor. First of all, let me thank you for the invitation, for uh, giving me this chance to discuss um, some of the issues of my former portfolio. It's um, a pleasure to see so many uh, colleagues with whom I was working before, either because you were minister at the time, a uh, member of European Parliament before. But um, the first part I would like to devote to, uh, in a very subjective fashion, to the Irish impact on the social agenda and uh, specifically on my work. And after the subjective introduction, I will slowly, slowly go into more political uh, discussions, but you will not notice. Uh, in, in fact, uh, um, it, it is um, sometimes a question whether it was the first time for me to come to Ireland um, when I was a commissioner. The answer is no. Um, in fact, the first time I came to Ireland when I was a student in Manchester. And um, it, it lasted for one year. And uh, it started at the time of uh, Black Wednesday. And uh, it was still this big financial crisis period of the ERM when it ended, but it definitely didn't want to go home without crossing uh, the sea and, and seeing uh, Dublin. And one of the places I visited was Kilmainham Jail. And I learned a bit about the history of the independence um, uh, movement. And what was quite interesting, to see um, that some of the leading members of um, the independence movement um, in the late uh, 19th century looked at the Hungarian case. And they looked into the possibility to make a kind of compromise in a way Hungary made a compromise with Austria, with the Habsburg uh, Empire. I'm mentioning this um, because um, in this year we celebrate the 150th anniversary of the famous compromise Hungary made with um, Austria. And um, this was indeed followed by a period of um, enormous prosperity. So this new setup was um, allowing a lot of uh, investment to come to the country, opening up of international uh, markets. And of course, very uneven development, what concerns social uh, groups and what concerns various national uh, groups that uh, at that time lived um, on the large territory of the uh, Habsburg Empire and within that, uh, the, the Hungarian kingdom. Nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, a lot of prosperity followed. And um, very often when people discuss uh, um, pooling sovereignty and how to create a multinational uh, system uh, in a balanced way, people look back to this time, which was, now we can say, a short episode, a kind of transitory period between the centuries of the Habsburg Empire and what we have now, but still a kind of example of sharing competencies in the area of finance, uh, foreign affairs uh, and defense, while uh, preserving a lot of competencies for the national uh, level for those Austrians, uh, Hungarians, and the Croats, um, who maintained to some extent relative um, autonomy at that time. A work in the Commission allowed me to come uh, back to Dublin on many occasions. Uh, first, when uh, the coalition government was formed in 2011, and subsequently several times at the, at, at the time of the uh, presidency, um, uh, and not least because I was responsible for Eurofound, um, and, uh, and we worked together a lot on many, many issues. What I wanted to highlight is that indeed the Irish presidency, um, which took place at the time of a severe 
Eurozone crisis, did its utmost uh, not only to limit the social consequences of the crisis in Ireland, but also to promote the social dimension of uh, the European Union. Let me give you three examples. There could be more, but the three which I consider uh, very important um, from that period. Uh, number one, I would say a kind of emblematic uh, achievement of that period, um, the so-called use guarantee, uh, a European scheme uh, with European policy coordination based on the best available examples of tackling youth unemployment in various European countries like Austria and Finland, adding some further funds to those countries and regions which struggle uh, with this problem without additional resources, and then creating um, a, a, a European effort, feeding also into the European semester with country-specific recommendations, but also providing a lot of technical assistance in addition to the additional funding to those who want to implement. This uh, policy was um, a result of uh, a snowballing of youth initiatives. I'm using the word uh, snowballing because uh, in 2010 we launched the Europe 2020 strategy. It already had a youth component, which was called Youth on the Move. Um, but then the crisis came, so you had to add more elements. First, we called um, it a Youth Opportunities Initiative to highlight, um, for example, the possibility of microfinance for young entrepreneurs. Um, uh, but then the crisis uh, came uh, in, in, in a ferocious uh, way. You had the movement of the indignados in uh, Spain. You had the riots in the UK in many cities. So we thought that, okay, this is really the time uh, to go beyond the halfway solutions and the token um, uh, issues will definitely not be enough. Let's try um, what is in the possibility of the EU to do as much as uh, possible. So the Commission made the proposal in 2012 December. And within about three months, the Irish presidency helped to hammer out uh, uh, um, an agreement in Council. The official adoption was in April, but this is still, in European standards, a high-speed uh, decision uh, making. Um, and that, uh, luckily, coincided with the budget debate. And, um, and, and this budget, the outcome of the budget debate, uh, which also took place on, under the uh, Irish presidency, was extremely favorable for the social dimension. Um, we got quite a few things which we wanted, but we were uncertain that we could get it. For example, to have within co cohesion policy a minimum share for the European Social Fund. For about 20 years, the share of the Social Fund in cohesion policy went down and down and down <coughs> because for many recipients who were autonomous to decide on the allocations, um, it was somehow more appealing to build motorways and roundabouts as opposed to investing in people. We thought uh, in 11, when the framework was designed, that yeah, it's time to, to stop and, if possible, reverse this decline. We proposed a minimum share, and while in many uh, you know, uh, rounds it, 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 it was not seen as the most hopeful, but at the end, uh, this was possible. And within the European Social Fund, we also ring-fenced a part of the funding for measures related directly to social inclusion. This was, again, uh, something that was not the case before. Uh, there was you know, freedom for the member states to program as they wished, but we insisted on def defining uh, priorities, and then uh, the end result was quite favorable. But beyond the European Social Fund, there were several other smaller financial instruments um, which, which emerged from this debate. The European Globalization Adjustment Fund was under threat. Ireland has been a beneficiary. Irish workers in, in many companies, uh, at the case of large-scale redundancies, um, were uh, supported um, for a, 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 a transitory period for retraining, for example, or to, to be able to launch a new enterprise from the EGF. 
but there was far from real consensus. Some of the larger member states, including one which is closest to you, didn't want to see the, the continuation of um, the EGF. Uh, somehow the end game turned out to be positive. And the same applies to another smaller fund which was called the European Aid to the Most Deprived. Again, um, this is a small uh, fund, but in many countries, extremely important that this uh, fund exists. Plus, on the top of that, um, a new uh, fund was created to top up uh, the resources that go to help the young people. That was called the Youth Employment Initiative. Normally, the budget debates result in cutting funds rather than creating something new. Uh, but in the end game of this, um, under the Irish presidency, I won't repeat it again, right? You just take it. It was at, your, at the time of your So um, this was newly introduced. This was newly introduced because that was indeed um, uh, the time when the leaders wanted to demonstrate that it, you know, we are very unfortunate with this crisis, but we are doing our utmost and creating a separate fund has some kind of symbolic importance to, to, to send a message that this is a European effort and there is a European value for it. And uh, I cannot resist uh, mentioning that I had a very unlikely uh, meeting about this with Ender Kenny in Davos, uh, where at the end of one of the dinners I had in Davos, it turned out that there was an Irish dinner next door. And uh, at some point the Prime Minister appeared in the door and uh, negotiated with various uh, people about various things. So I used this opportunity to raise the issue of the use guarantee. And um, he, he, he was indeed um, very well informed. It was just a few weeks after the start of the presidency in Dublin. And uh, indeed, it was clear that the new policy makes sense if there is an additional uh, fund. And I think he was fully supportive, uh, together with the other prime ministers who were present in Davos. So sometimes people wonder what is happening in Davos, what kind of secretive uh, meetings uh, take place. The world of finance conspires against everybody else. No, in this particular occasion, at least, I can tell you that um, we used it to, to nail down some key components of, uh, of the Youth Employment um, Initiative with um, the Prime Minister of the Presidency country. And um, so I mentioned two issues, one use guarantee, one the budgetary issues, which I think for the social portfolio um, were very good outcome. And there was a, um, a, a third um, remarkable example, um, a, 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 a joint work with uh, your minister colleague, uh, John Burton, um, on the social investment package, um, which followed in the footsteps of a previous uh, <laughs> policy package, the employment package of 2012, um, whereby we wanted to demonstrate that uh, the social policy in the EU is not reduced to employment, but we also want to uh, take care of um, uh, the importance of preserving well-functioning welfare states. Um, not only pre pre preserving, but also, just like in the case of the Youth Guarantee, to highlight which are the best examples, the best models in Europe, and give some kind of guidance, um, uh, support, um, orientation, <coughs> Uh, towards uh, upgrading and modernizing national welfare systems. This clearly uh, stretched into some areas which are member state competence, but this was not at all uh, an improvised exercise um, because, um, because um, in 2010, when the Europe 2020 strategy was launched, we already envisaged that at some point we have to deliver so-called recommendations on child poverty. And uh, addressing child poverty remained the centerpiece of this social investment uh, package. But by that time, also because of the crisis, we thought that it's much better to embed it in a broader package. And also in this package, we can address other issues of welfare uh, systems. For example, uh, homelessness, 
there were some expectations among NGOs that the Commission would do something uh, very big on homelessness, which was not really allowed by, um, by the mood at that time, when, um, when a lot of people thought that expectations were raised as compared to that a crisis came and we would need to close this gap as opposed to widen the gap between the, the EU expectations and, um, and, and the deliverables. But still, I think an excellent um, document was uh, produced on, um, on, on, on homelessness and uh, how to prevent and how to tackle it um, within the member states and what kind of EU support can be mobilized in this area on demography, but also how to develop the social economy within member states, which I think was one of the interesting uh, parts of our activity. So these, um, uh, and one of the big presidency uh, conferences, actually not in Dublin, but in Leuven, in the Irish College, took place about um, the social investment package after it was uh, uh, published. So I think also now these um, um, achievements are looked at uh, you know, very important steps the European Union made at this time. Uh, number one, to clarify that um, Europe is um, not about uh, to give up uh, what was already achieved by member states and, uh, and uh, by the EU level uh, together, but um, building on uh, the existing best models, mobilizing the resources which are available to move uh, forward. And um, I should just repeat that it was really a great pleasure to work um, with the Irish presidency on these issues, and I could continue the list, um, but I would like to make uh, now a political point of this, which is to highlight that at that time and also subsequently, we saw an enormous gap between the Irish approach to the social dimension of the European Union and the British approach to the social dimension of the European Union. I have listed a number of uh, um, examples which were seen as achievements at that time. And I stress the decisive contribution of your presidency and uh, maybe it's not necessary to say that there, there, there were always reluctant countries as well. And one of the most reluctant countries, whatever was the issue, uh, was uh, the UK. For example, we were absolutely convinced that all UK regions would benefit from a use guarantee scheme. That was also the feedback from various stakeholders in the UK. But the government did it at it utmost that in the British context, this expression would not be used. Right? All other countries should use the word uh, use guarantee, but in Britain they should use their own uh, vocabulary. They had at the time of the experiment with a use contract and, uh, and, and various other schemes which uh, worked out at various uh, quality. But what they had as a use contract definitely uh, uh, fell short of the commitment of the use guarantee, for example, in terms of the deadline of how quickly uh, a new job or learning opportunity should be given to the young people. Um, um, and, and, and it had no commitment to the quality of the job or the quality of the service which is to be uh, provided. And it lagged the, the effort to reach out to the needs. They were focusing on those who were already registered as, as young unemployed but they had no calculation to reach out to the needs, who were not even registered, but dropped out of the school, um, for example. So it was um, a, a, a complex discussion on that front. On the budgetary questions, I already alluded to that. The UK um, was not really keen on uh, a variety of aspects, and my uh, missions to uh, Britain at that time were, for example, trying to promote the aid for the most deprived, which the social policy reforms of Mr. Ian Duncan Smith would have necessitated. They, they changed the social benefit system, which um, introduced a lot of conditionality and changed also the payment dates to the poor people. And, um, and that 
meant that a lot of people which were covered before were only covered at the end of a long period and it was very easy to drop out if you just missed a phone call or uh, you didn't show up once, you already missed uh, out on, on something important which gave rise to a lot of food banks in the UK for which the UK could still have used uh, the, the EU fund for the most deprived but they decided not to, they decided not to. The UK also always refrained from using the Globalisation Adjustment Fund, despite the fact that members of the European Parliament from the UK occasionally came to us that, look, in Yorkshire and elsewhere, there is a need. There, 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 there was a dismissal, there was a relocation of a company elsewhere. Um, uh, but we said that, look, yes, we are ready, we are ready, but it has to be asked from London. It's the national government that needs to request uh, the support. And uh, the, the UK government always um, rejected this, uh, uh, this um, uh, idea. Now, why am I saying this? Um, I'm mentioning these examples of um, the UK uh, being a very reluctant, if not negative, player in the social dimension, uh, you know, which um, adds to well-known stories on the working time directive, for example, in order to highlight that the lack of a visible social dimension of the European Union in the UK was a contributing factor to the Brexit vote. Um, of course, we know that from the very start, from the time of Maastricht, there was always opposition to EU membership. There was always strong opposition to Eurozone membership um, in, in, in the UK. It's not a coincidence that Nigel Lawson was one of the figureheads of the Leave campaign, and it's uh, less than 10 individuals who put together the money, the campaign funding for the Leave campaign uh, last year. So some very rich people, surely. But this was not the decisive factor. The decisive factor was that a lot of people in uh, the Midlands and in the North also shifted to the Leave camp, uh, plus Wales, um, because um, they felt left behind, they felt excluded. And um, even if I would say that it was primarily the policy of Westminster, the policy or the lack of policy uh, from London, which uh, resulted in these feelings and the opposition people showed uh, with the Leave vote was an opposition primarily to Westminster. Um, nevertheless, the result was that um, the Leave side won and the UK is leaving. In my view, this is um, really a warning example for many others. This is a warning example for, for many others that, uh, number one, uh, the, 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 the picture of a European Union which is reduced to a free market uh, may be favorable or favored by some, but this is not a picture of a European Union that could uh, carry the support and the confidence of wide uh, social groups and, 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 and communities. So uh, the EU um, indeed has to continue, maybe even more forcefully, to ensure that economic prosperity is widely shared in terms of social groups, but also in terms of various regions within uh, individual uh, countries. So, of course, we have very limited capacity to kind of uh, revisit the British case because uh, even if uh, you know, British politics sometimes gives the impression of confusion, there is a certain dynamic which I think already uh, sealed the question of uh, Brexit and it will happen. The only question is what kind of new relationships will emerge between the 27 countries and the United Kingdom and it couldn't be a more pertinent question than, than, than here. However, I think this also holds some lessons um, about how to shape the social dimension of the European Union uh, for the future. Maybe you know that um, 
recently, the Commission launched a series of reflection papers. And one of these reflection papers, actually the very first one, is focusing on the social dimension of uh, the European Union. And the publication of this um, uh, document coincided with the publication of um, um, a communication on the uh, European pillar of social rights, which is, in a way, a conclusion of a, a year-long uh, debate um, across the member states and with uh, various stakeholders. Um, I would say that um, uh, I think the lessons um, of my Irish and British experience could be summed up in three points. Um, and then um, we could discuss many others uh, during uh, the rest of the time. But my three conclusive points are the following. Number one is that in the European Union, we have to speak about a social dimension and not purely a social policy. Right? In, the, in, the, in the text of uh, the treaty, but also very often in the European debates, uh, there is a very clear definition of what social policy is. And interestingly, the EU vocabulary is not the same as the vocabulary of social science, because in the EU treaty vocabulary, social policy is practically about how to regulate the workplace and what kind of labor legislation and EU action is there to support uh, a level of playing field in terms of working conditions, the working time, health and safety, and similar uh, areas. But I think the point is that the social pact, if I may use this expression, the social pact about the European Union is much wider, is much wider than what you find in the social policy chapter of um, the treaty. It includes many <coughs> other uh, components, which uh, in the area of the budget, for example, in the area of the regulation of the single market, um, in the area of promoting regional development, contribute to fulfilling the social objectives of the member states. Which means that, yes, the EU has to take care of uh, this uh, field, which is defined in the treaty as um, a social policy, and there are always new developments, like today the consequences of automation and digitalization. They give a homework to, to modernize, to update this part of uh, the EU uh, policy. But equally important is to pay attention to the social dimension of many other issues. I give you maybe just one example. Um, and then we can gap, come back to, to others. Um, we had in the last few years a big story about TTIP. TTIP is trade. But if we don't pay attention to the social dimension of TTIP, then we will end up uh, in a very difficult area where there will be no public consensus about w the consequences of TTIP, and there will be no public acceptance of uh, of, of trade and investment relations um, um, with the United States or, 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 or other partners. So I think this is um, a good example, but we could find from many other areas um, further examples that uh, the social dimension um, has to be uh, controlled. We cannot simply leave it to the invisible hand of the market, whether it's inside the European Union or whether it is internationally what kind of social outcome various economic uh, activities or various types of the integration will have. Of course, we can extend this to the social dimension of the monetary union, which we started to monitor in 2013 with a new scoreboard. And um, I would say that still this forms a part on the reflections on the economic and monetary union, which, by the way, is subject of another reflection paper that has already been published by the Commission. And they recycled many ideas uh, that have already been put forward in 2012 in the so-called blueprint, including automatic uh, stabilizers for the EMU. So that's point one uh, about social policy and the social uh, dimension. 
Um, the point uh, two would be that um, when we speak about the social dimension, I think we have to see that all arms of governance have to be used and mobilized uh, uh, in this area. Um, sometimes we feel that there is a simplification um, that social policy at the EU level is about legislation. Yes, there is a core of EU social policy, which is EU law. In fact, if you look at the totality of, uh, of, of labor legislation, it's a smaller part of labor legislation which has been elevated to the level of the European Union, and primarily this serves uh, the purpose of having a level playing uh, field and protect uh, uh, good working conditions in, um, in, in, in the member states. But uh, this um, uh, uh, portfolio has developed and used many other instruments. I already mentioned one which I consider important, the budgetary. And I think whenever there is a new budget debate, and now there is one, it's very important to ensure that the budgetary instruments which support the social agenda are preserved and further fine-tuned, developed, and, uh, and can match the requirements of uh, the day. So this applies to the social fund. But um, in 2010, we also recognized that the regional fund is also making a contribution to the fight against poverty, uh, for example. And uh, I already highlighted the importance of some of the smaller instruments. Of course, there can be new configurations. So it's not a necessity that all these funds are framed in the same form, in the same way, uh, for all the time ahead. Uh, but it's very important to see what function they serve, and if that function is still necessary um, to continue with uh, these instruments. So that's legislation, funding, but also policy coordination is very important, and the example of the use guarantee was used. The final point is that in this reflection paper, which we saw, there is a question whether the social dimension of the EU should be connected with uh, just one issue, the free movement of workers, or with the Eurozone, so a kind of territorial re restriction, or it should be deepened for the EU as a whole. In my view, only the third option works. I think free movement is very, very narrow. There are many other issues, including the legislation I cited, which go well beyond uh, free movement and provide um, the, the, the social base for the functioning of the single market. And the single market is not only the Eurozone. Even if the British question may be uh, you know, outdated soon, but, but, but the Eurozone will not be the same as the entire EU for some time. And I think it's very important that countries that, uh, for the time being, not part of the Eurozone, will be fully integrated in uh, uh, the design, but also the implementation of the EU social agenda.